The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount there. We'll be picking up in verse 21, reading through verse 37. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, You fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, oh God, we pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, the ones I place in our way, eyes to see what you have for us, hands and hearts open to receive it, and feet and wills, Lord, ready to take it with us into the world. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord, amen. I know it's probably obvious just from looking at me now, but I'm a pretty athletic person. It hurts my feelings that you laugh. (laughs) It started probably when I was in the third grade. That was the first time I ever played organized sports. I played baseball, Dixie pre-minors. I was on the White Sox, uh, not the real ones in case you were confused. I remember I, my dad had even bought me a bat. It was a, back when they were made out of aluminum, had a rubberized handle. I was really something. But I never hit a ball with that bat. Every at bat, I either watched them go by or struck out. Until one day, one day I got in the batter's box. First pitch came and I swung and ting, foul ball. Man, at least I made contact. I was excited. I had hit the ball, but I was still up. I was still up to bat, so there was still a chance to miss it altogether. I got in and got settled down, pitch came, all 40 miles an hour of it. I swung and ting, foul ball. Oh man, this is exciting. I hit it again. So now my third grade mind said something. I thought this, I recall. All right, now contact is good, but if you can get the ball to go forward, that's even better. What's the easiest way to get the ball to go forward? Well, bunt it, of course. And so I remember turning around. Coach looked at me like, what are you doing, Thomas? Just standing there holding the bat like a chump who never knew how to bunt a ball. Standing there waiting for the pitcher to throw the ball. He reared back and threw it. And sure enough, my bat hit the ball and it went behind my head. Oh, well, doesn't matter. It's a foul ball, right? And the umpire says, 
Strike three, you're out. Hold up, Blue. No. It's a foul ball. I get as many of those as I want. But some of you already know, right? If you bunt on the third strike and it goes foul, it is a strike and you are out. Who told you that? (laughs) Nobody told me that. And so I slunked back to the dugout to where my coach, or assistant coach James, said, what is wrong with you? I just wanted to hit the ball. Nobody told me about that rule. Don't you hate it when when you're in the middle of something and somebody tells you a rule as you're breaking it? Somebody gives you the rule as you run afoul of it. No pun intended with the baseball thing there. What about when people change the rules in the middle of something? Yesterday, um, the boys and I, we came up here uh, to the church. The boys rode their, bi- rode their bikes around, and then we played on the playground, and Cole said, Dada, let's play tag. Tag, if you're unfamiliar, a very simple game. It is so simple, in fact, there aren't even proper titles in it. You're just what? It. <laughs> the easiest pronoun of them all. The most ambiguous pronoun of them all, you're it. You're not the tagger, you're not the chaser, you're it. And so Cole says, Dada, you're it. And so off we go, running in the mulch and the pea gravel. And as I get closer and closer, I'm about to tag him. What does he do? He says, pause game. (laughs) Hold up, this isn't the rule, son. Tag is really simple. You're it, and you have to tag somebody else. That's it. No, Dada, you're getting too close. These aren't the rules. Eventually, he walked a few steps and said, unpause game, and ran around. Eventually, I'm glad to report to you, I'm I'm creeping up on 36. I can still outrun a five-year-old. I caught up with him, and I tagged him, and now he was it. And so Cole started, instead of chasing Carter, who I thought would be the easier prey, started chasing me. And as he got further and further away, guess what he did? Pause game. What is it, son? I thought maybe he had a rocking issue. He got a little closer, and he said, "Um, (laughs) unpause. Tagged me. Changing rule. None of you do this, I'm sure. I had people in my family every year around the holidays. We'd sit around the card table, break out Uno, Skip Bow, uh, Phase 10, those kind of monopoly if we were, you know, just wanting to not see each other for another year. Um, And we'd sit around the card table, and eventually, as we were playing, let's say, Uno, somebody would skip the person next to them, and they'd come back around, and guess what? They'd skip them again. Oh, wait, wait. That's not in the rules. That's not, you can't do. You can't skip somebody two times in a row. Yes, you can. Now we're not playing Uno anymore. Now it's a philosophical argument as to why the rules aren't right. <laughs> they changed rules. In the middle. Don't you hate when somebody changes the rules in the middle of the game? or when you discover a new rule as you're breaking it. I think if we're not careful, we can read these words from Jesus and think that he's changing the rules. That he's telling us in the middle of the game that all of a sudden we're breaking the rules. Now I know, we know this passage, you've heard it before, maybe, I I hope you have. Jesus says, you've heard of it said, and then he goes on, Matthew doesn't have a really good way to organize this, so we just say these are some of Jesus' sayings in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't have any uh, pithy anecdotes. He just gets right into it. You've heard that it was said of those of ancient times, you shall not murder. And I imagine everyone standing around the Mount goes, "Mm -hmm, amen, yes, right on, Brother Jesus. You're right. You shall not murder. What is that? That's not just one of those suggestions. It's not even just a rule. We got a bigger word for that. It's a commandment. It's one of the big ones. One of the ten. One of the ten commandments so ingrained in our culture. I remember when I was in high school and college, there were a lot of neighborhoods you'd drive around and they'd have yard signs of the ten commandments out in their yards. So ingrained in our culture that when Cecil B. DeMille made his movie back in the last century, he didn't call it Exodus. He didn't call it Moses. What did he call it? The Ten Commandments. 
Those are the big ones. And if you think we think they're important, and let's not even talk about what we are, a little beef with them or history with them in Alabama, if you think they're important to us, imagine sitting around the mountain, around the hill, as Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. This isn't just a commandment. This isn't just a novel rule. This is a part of the covenant. The covenant that God made with the people of Israel on Sinai with Moses. You shall not murder. Yes, Jesus, we've been told it since we were born. We nailed it literally to the frames of our doors. Some of us wear it around our heads, strapped on boxes to our foreheads. Jesus, we know you shall not murder. It's the covenant. It's the commandment. We know it. It's the rule. But I say to you, you don't have to read the rest. But I say to you, hold on, Jesus. Now, the Bible says you shall not murder. That's what it says. You don't get to change it. You don't get to add to it. You don't get to mess with it. But I say to you, hold on. Now, unless you're going to say this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, don't add anything to it, Jesus. But I say to you. Now, also, as Christians... If you haven't read this, you might want to think that Jesus is going to be a little more gracious. You have heard it said of those of ancient times, you shall not murder. But you know they some folks, you just, we I mean, don't kill them, but you can smack them, right? You almost want Jesus to give us a little bit of grace that way, right? Like, don't murder, but you know, there's some people, if they you just cut them out of your life. Post about them on social media. Uh, don't invite them to dinner, right? That's what we expect, but that's not what he says. I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, hmm, y'all ever been mad with somebody? You ever been angry with somebody? Now, at first, at first reading, it sounds like he's changing the rules, doesn't it? You've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I'm telling you, you better not be angry. That's not what he says. If you are angry. That reads more like, wait a minute, Jesus, we didn't know about this rule. We didn't know about this rule. Jesus, what are you, what are you talking about? It doesn't get any better. Just in this one little saying alone. If you are angry, you'll be liable to judgment if you insult a brother or sister. They don't even have to be somebody you know. None of you have done this, so I'm just going to say it myself. Driving down uh, 21 there in front of Jack State, you're in the left-hand lane. What happens? Somebody cuts over. You don't say, oh, you most pleasant person who has ever graced the face of the earth. Right? You insult someone. Brother or sister, you're liable to the council. And if you say, you fool. I like the way Luke leaves it in the Hebrew, in his version. If you say, racha, because that just sounds fierce. And if you say, you fool. I'm pretty guilty. I've never said that, I don't think. But I know I've said, you idiot. You dummy. I've done it. And if that disqualifies me, I'm sorry, but I, I have. You, he says, will be liable to the hell of fire. He's changing the rules. He's telling us a rule in the middle of the game that we didn't know we were breaking. Or is he? Or is he? You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, most folks can say, well, yeah, I didn't done that. But Jesus says, well, but I say to you, I don't want you to pay attention, by the way, to what he says. That everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Who's the liable party here? Not, not the, the woman in this case, but the one who lusts after her, Jesus says. That's the problem. It doesn't matter what she's wearing, where she's walking, who she is. The fault lies with the one who lusts after her, Jesus says. Man, if 
your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better to enter into perfection. It's better to enter into glory missing something than for your whole body to go into hell, Jesus said. And he just keeps going. Like he doesn't give us time to process all these rules, all these changes. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Man, we've heard this one uh, used in and out. I, I heard it all the time growing up. My dad married three times, my mom twice. I heard it all the time about divorce. I say to you, anyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of unchastity, Matthew puts that in there. Luke doesn't have it. The other tellings don't. Matthew wants to keep it. He doesn't want to discount Moses' exceptions that he has in the law. He says he causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Those are hard words to hear. Is he changing the rules? Now, I want to stress to you, we're just going to park over here on the side for a minute, and we'll come back to the rest of the sermon in just a second. When Jesus talks about, about divorce, this isn't our modern understanding. This is a man who's tired of his wife and decides he wants a different wife, and he puts her away in a divorce made legal by the bending and twisting of Moses' words, leaving her to the elements, leaving her to her own, to say, well, you can either become a prostitute or you can beg. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's a sin. You're causing a woman to do this. That's why he decries it here. But he doesn't give us any more chance. He doesn't give us a pause. Again, you heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not swear falsely. Carry out the vows you've made. I don't go around making vows. I don't go around swearing, not in this way anyway, very much. But Jesus at the end says, let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than that comes from the evil one. I may be guilty of this one the most, because I hate telling people no sometimes when I need to tell them no. I hate telling people yes when I really don't want to tell them yes. Pick up the phone. Chris, can you do this? Can you come up? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to, but yeah. Chris, can you do this? Well, I hate to say no. No, I don't. Maybe. That's mine. You, Sally's not here, but you, she'll tell you that's my big one. It's like, we'll see. That's mine. I don't want to say yes. I don't want to say no. We'll see. We'll see. Man. That's not coming from me, Jesus. That's from the evil one. That, that's not me. That's not Jesus giving us an excuse. That's saying, if you don't say it straight, it's not from God. He's changing the rules. Telling us rules we didn't know we were breaking, even as we read them, realizing, oh no, we're breaking them. And then here's where we hear the word of grace we've heard so much, Right? But Jesus says all of this to show us that we'll never measure up. Jesus shows this to say we'll always fall short. Jesus tells, tells us this to say this is how we'll always get it wrong. And friends, that's right. But it's dangerous. Because if I think Jesus is just giving me an excuse, I'm not going to fix it. If Jesus is just going to give me grace, as an excuse, what, what evidence do I have to fix anything, to change who I am? This is why I think we need a deeper and more outrageous understanding of grace. That grace isn't just about getting us off the hook. Grace is about giving us the power to do it. Grace is about giving us the power to live these words, words that aren't the changing of rules, but Jesus holding up the magnifying glass to say it's deeper than that. That at the heart of it, it's not about don't kill somebody. Most of us can go our whole lives without ever having to worry about breaking that commandment. Jesus says it's not about that. It's about seeing the value of a person. It's about getting to the heart of the matter that when you're angry with somebody, you're devaluing them and you may as well in your heart murder them. It's about when you lust after a woman, it's not about seeing her for who she is, but about seeing her for what she can do for you. You're devaluing her. Jesus says no, it's the same thing when you lust after them. 
It's at the same thing. It's the heart of it all. He's not changing the rules. He's not shifting the ground underneath us. He's saying this is what it means. And grace is there. Grace is there when we fall. Grace is there when we literally sin, miss the mark of what God calls us to. But more than that, grace is there to call us to be better. Grace is there to call us to say, it's not just you get off the hook. It's that God has given you the grace, the outrageous grace, to live this. And you may fail today. You may falter tomorrow. You may get mad at that person who cuts you off on 21. You may call them a name. You may, as soon as you walk out those doors, realize there's somebody in your life you don't want to talk to. Somebody you're angry with. Somebody you're mad at. May even be in this room with you right now. Doesn't mean it's okay. It means Jesus is calling us with that grace to live out the words he says, not to just get us off, but to call us towards it, to live that life, to tell us it's not, not you can't do it, but that with my grace, you can do it. And he calls us to it. He's not just changing the rules. He's showing us what we're supposed to be all along what God's called us to be from the very beginning. You've heard it said, but now Jesus is saying to you, what? What is Jesus saying to you here and now? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you call us to grace. You give us grace. But Lord, not simply as a way to excuse our sin and our selfishness. But grace, Lord, to call us on into your likeness. Grace to give us the power to be the people you call us to be. You give us grace, Lord, that saves us and grace that sustains us in this life to be your hands and feet, to be your body. And so, Lord, now as we listen for your spirit, we pray, Lord, that you speak those words of grace into our hearts, into our lives. Or not so that we are just simply off the hook. But, Lord, that we may respond to your grace and seek to live it more fully each and every day. Be with us now, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts as we sing, as we listen, as we move. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.